In the West, we tend to define World War II as starting in 1939 with the German invasion of Poland. However, there is a strong case to be made by leading Chinese and other Asian historians that World War II actually began on July 7th, 1937 with the outbreak of the Second Sino-Japanese War. At the beginning of the 20th century, the modern world emphasized the superiority of European imperial powers on the world stage. Thus, when Japan's own empire began to grow in Asia, few considered it to be anything more than a regional power and little threat to empires such as that of Britain, France, and Russia, all of whom imprinted their influence in Asia and the Pacific. All that would change in the wake of the Russo-Japanese War fought between 1904 and 1906, during which Japan stunned the world by decisively defeating the Russian Navy at the Battle of Tsushima. As well as forcing the world to accept for the first time that an Asian power was now a top player in military and diplomatic matters, it also bestowed great pride and confidence in the Japanese. British historian Geoffrey Reagan highlighted the impact this confidence had on the Japanese mindset in this period. Quote, Victory over one of the world's great powers convinced some Japanese military men that with more ships and bigger and better ones, similar victories could be won throughout the Pacific. Perhaps no power could resist the Japanese Navy, not even Britain and the United States. It can therefore be argued that the victory at Tsushima set Japan on the road to war with the old white imperial powers in Asia. Nationalism and militarism prevailed over Japanese culture in the decades that followed, and this led to successful operations in support of the Allies against Imperial Germany during World War I, including a naval force operating in the Mediterranean. However, the post-war arms limitations were viewed in Tokyo as the West trying to hold on to its influence in Asia and curtail Japan from achieving her destiny. This bred resentment and paranoia as Japan made inroads into Korea and China. In January 1931, Japanese troops invaded Manchuria in southeast China after Japanese troops staged a terrorist attack on a Japanese-owned railway line. The invasion was deemed illegitimate by the international community, further isolating Japan as they expanded their power. In 1937, tensions between the Chinese and the Japanese occupying Manchuria flared up, and the two sides erupted into full-scale war. Japanese troops would also engage in skirmishes with the Soviet Union, and these conflicts bestowed Japanese troops and their commanders with a wealth of combat experience that they would eventually pit against the Allies after the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. In today's episode of Wars of the World's Deadliest Combatants, we take a look at some of the most proficient and feared warriors of the Empire of Japan, the deadliest Japanese soldiers of World War II. Like all major naval powers, Japan invested heavily in submarines leading up to and during the Second World War. Given the immense size of the Pacific theater, Japanese submarines often had to roam far and wide on long range patrols, and in order to be capable of this, Japan built a force of cruiser submarines. In order to carry fuel and supplies for such operations, Japanese cruiser submarines often dwarfed American and European subs. The Japanese Type B-1 submarine, for example, was over three times the size of the German Type 7 U-boat, which was the most common type of U-boat in service in the German Navy. Arming these underwater monsters were the best torpedoes of the war. The Type 95 torpedo, 
based on the Type 93 known to the Allies as the Long Lance, but adapted for undersea use. The Type 95 was the fastest torpedo in the world at the time, being capable of speeds in excess of 55 miles per hour, making it extremely difficult to evade. Early in the war, Japanese submarines shelled the American coastline in a bold move, and while the attacks did moderate damage, it forced the US to commit large numbers of men and resources to building up defenses against future attacks. It would also be a Japanese submarine that would be the instigator of one of the most tragic stories of the war, and captain of that submarine was Mokitsura Hashimoto. Born into a large family in Kyoto and the son of a Shinto priest, Hashimoto was encouraged to attend the Imperial Japanese Naval Academy by his father, who felt that it would give his son the best chance in life in the new, militarized Japan of the 20s. Leaving home for the academy in 1927, he graduated four years later, and in 1934, he volunteered for duties with Japan's submarine service. During the attack on Pearl Harbor, Hashimoto was serving aboard the submarine I-24, which launched midget submarines that were originally intended to participate in the attack. After Pearl Harbor, he returned home to retrain in taking command of his own submarine. After commanding smaller subs in Japanese waters, where he participated in research and development of new tactics and weapons, he took command of the I-158 for a brief period before assuming command of the I-58, which was just nearing completion. During construction, the vessel was modified to be able to launch Caton manned suicide torpedoes, four of which could be carried at one time. Hashimoto and the I-58 would launch numerous Catons from December 1944 until the end of the war, but they would achieve few successes for the loss of their operators. In these final stages of the war, Allied air power was overwhelming, and at times the I-58 was under near constant air attack. While in port, the submarine narrowly escaped destruction during an air raid by Boeing B-29 Super Fortresses when bombs landed in the water near its location. Then, in the waning hours of July 29th, 1945, I-58 surfaced some 250 miles north of the Palau Islands to recharge its batteries. Shortly after 2300 hours, the navigation officer, Lieutenant Tanaka, spotted a ship approaching from the east, traveling at an estimated 12 knots. Given their location and the fact that the Japanese surface fleet was all but decimated at this point, Hashimoto knew it was an American warship. In the low light, he incorrectly identified the target as an Idaho-class battleship, but it was in fact the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis, which had set sail from Guam the previous day. The Indianapolis had been on a top-secret mission, delivering key parts and nuclear material for the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombs. Curiously, the Indianapolis was not zigzagging, which was a maneuver designed to evade submarine attack, despite the Americans knowing Japanese subs were in the area. Seizing the opportunity, Hashimoto submerged the I-58, and at 23.26 hours, the submarine fired a spread of six Type 95 torpedoes at two second intervals. At 23.35, Hashimoto observed two equally spaced hits on the cruiser's starboard side, through the I-58's periscope. The ship stopped and began listing to starboard. Hashimoto decided to attack again, but as the next torpedoes were being loaded, the Indianapolis capsized and sank. Still needing to recharge, Hashimoto resurfaced and headed north at high speed, expecting American rescue ships and aircraft to arrive soon. Of the 1,195 men on board, around 300 went down with the Indianapolis and a further 890 more would die from a combination of exposure, dehydration, and shark attacks before the survivors were rescued over four days later. The sinking of the Indianapolis resulted in the greatest single loss of life at sea from a single ship in the history of the United States Navy, and was one of the final significant victories of the war for Japan's submarines. Hashimoto and the I-58 would make several more Caton attacks in the final months of the war, but with little success. Ultimately, the sub was sunk by Americans a year later. After Japan's surrender, Hashimoto was given command of the famous destroyer Yukikaze, 
which had been stripped of weapons and was now being used to repatriate Japanese soldiers left overseas. In December of 1945, he travelled to Oakland, California to testify in the court martial of the Indianapolis' captain, Charles B. McVeigh, for the ship's loss. Despite Hashimoto testifying that even if the American ship was zigzagging, he still could have conducted a successful attack, McVeigh was found guilty of negligence. Soon after, Hashimoto became a civilian freighter captain, but after a collision with another ship, he was forced to resign and instead followed in his father's footsteps by becoming a Shinto priest. In December of 1990, Hashimoto met with some of the survivors of the Indianapolis at Pearl Harbor, where he said through a translator, quote, I came here to pray with you for your shipmates, whose deaths I caused. To which survivor Giles McCoy simply responded, I forgive you. Hashimoto also worked with the survivors to get McVeigh exonerated, which he was on October 30th, 2001, five days after Hashimoto passed away, aged 91. Before the attack on Pearl Harbor, American and British commanders took a largely dismissive opinion of the caliber of Japanese pilots. Their fighter pilots had been successful against the Chinese, but the Chinese were flying obsolete types and were poorly trained. Thus, when Allied warplanes began falling from the sky in the weeks after the surprise attack, those same Allied commanders were stunned and dumbfounded. Key to the Japanese success was the Mitsubishi A6M Zero fighter, which possessed extraordinary agility and speed compared to many of the American planes used in late 1941. The Americans were desperate to learn the secret of this plane, and special units were dispatched to receive crashed examples in order to learn the secrets of its performance. The results revealed a startling weakness. The A6M sacrificed armoured protection in order to keep the aircraft as light as possible, which gave it its high performance. Learning the characteristics of this plane, new tactics and later new aircraft such as the superlative F6F Hellcat, which was designed specifically to fight the Zero, emerged to tip the balance in favour of the Allies. Losses amongst the Japanese pilots rose, leading to the death of some of the most experienced fighter pilots, while new pilots were rushed through their training and gave a poor showing against the Allies. One of the Japanese aces who survived this turn in Japanese fortune was Tetsuzo Iwamoto, who would become Japan's official highest scoring ace. Born in Hokkaido on June 15th, 1916, Iwamoto looked set for a career in agriculture, going to an agricultural school and having an interest in botany and fishing. However, after graduating in 1934, he disobeyed his parents' wishes to attend college and instead took and passed the Imperial Japanese Navy's entrance exam for airmen eventually becoming a pilot in December of 1936. Undertaking advanced training in air combat, in 1938 he was deployed to join the war in China. On February 26, 1938, his squadron was attacked while escorting a group of Navy bombers by Chinese pilots flying Soviet-manufactured I-15 and I-16 fighters. During the battle that followed, Iomoto would claim three enemy planes destroyed and one probable, and by the time he returned to Japan in September of that year, he would have 14 kills to his credits, making him the highest scoring pilot of the conflict. After serving as an instructor in Japan, he would rejoin the fleet for the attack on Pearl Harbor, where he flew fighter cover in the formidable Zero. One of his earliest victories against American forces was the shooting down of a PBY-5A flying boat. He also participated in the crucial Battle of the Coral Sea, where he claimed several US Navy 4F4 Wildcat fighters, but while the battle was a Japanese victory, it left the Japanese fleet depleted of two crucial carriers while they underwent repairs. Their absence at the following Battle of Midway helped tip the balance in favour of the Americans and was the turning point in the war for the Pacific. 
Given the desperate need for new pilots, Iwamoto was ordered to return to his role as an instructor in August of 1942, where it was hoped he could impress his skill on new pilots. He would frequently return to combat over the coming years, and one of his most spectacular victories was the destruction of an American B-29 Superfortress in April 1945 as he participated in the defense of Japan against a near relentless allied onslaught. By the end of the war, he was tasked with training Japanese fearsome kamikaze pilots. With the war over, he wasn't initially recognized as Japan's leading ace. That title went to Hiroyoshi Nishizawa. However, post-war research has instead tilted that score in favor of Iwamoto, who is officially credited with 80 kills in World War II plus his 14 kills over China. Iwamoto himself dismissed this in his diary entries, which sum up a total of 202 aircraft, although these cannot be confirmed. If this were not confusing enough, there are those who continue to argue for Nishizawa, who is only officially credited with 36 victories. It is difficult to be sure the exact numbers, as the Japanese pilots and their commanders notoriously over-exaggerated their claims, leading to significantly higher numbers of claims being made than could be proven, and while this afflicted all sides in the war, the Japanese were among the biggest culprits. After the war, like many Japanese who had to bear the shame of defeat, Iwamoto fell into deep depression. He frequently suffered stomach problems, for which he had to undergo surgeries, one of which was botched by the surgeons and soon after he passed away on May 20th, 1955, aged just 38 years old. His wife has claimed that some of his final words were, when I get well, I want to fly again. Throughout history, there have been those who have been willing to give up their lives in the service of their country or in the defense of their comrades, but none have achieved the notoriety of Japan's kamikazes. The word kamikaze translates roughly into English as divine wind and was seen as a glorious death by the Japanese in the service of their emperor, who they viewed as a living god. Climbing into their aircraft, the pilots of the so-called special attack units became the guidance system for their aircraft, which became a weapon aimed at allied warships, especially the strategically vital carriers. Unlike any other weapon used by all sides during the war, the kamikaze was able to take evasive action if attacked, problem solve ways through an enemy's defenses, and finally seek out and strike a specific target. It was not just the kamikaze's destructive power that made them so feared, there was also the psychological impact they had on allied soldiers who faced them. Facing people who have become so determined to kill you that they'll willingly throw their own lives away unnerved even the most hardened sailor. The kamikazes also sent a message to the allies that if they were going to win the war, then the Japanese would make them pay for every inch of Japanese territory. There were many lethal kamikaze attacks, but probably one of the most successful was that carried out by one Ensign Kiyoshi Ogawa of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Born October 23rd, 1922, in the Gunma Prefecture in central Japan, Ogawa joined the military while at college and undertook pilot training just as the war was beginning to turn against Japan. Ogawa graduated from his training unit and was appointed as an ensign assigned to the Imperial Japanese Navy's 306th Fighter Squadron. Soon after, Ogawa put his name forward for a special attack unit. Like many men before and after him, Ogawa was asked, do you desire earnestly, wish or do not wish, to be involved in the kamikaze attacks? Ogawa was required to circle one of three choices, or alternatively leave the page blank. The Western view of kamikaze pilots is that they all went willingly to the special units, like ants being sacrificed to protect the ant hill, which in this case was Japan. However, this was not always the case. Many pilots did indeed put themselves forward for duty of their own volition, but in order to garner more volunteers, many new graduates such as Ogawa were posed this question to force them to make a decision. 
Some of the graduates who did not answer that they wished to join the units were often pressured by both superiors and their comrades to change their mind. Often they would be accused of cowardice, disloyalty, and warned that they would bring shame on their family if they did not. We will never know if Ogawa was pressured into volunteering or not, but either way, he was now a kamikaze. In May of 1945, the Allies were closing in on the Japanese home islands, and an invasion was on the horizon. One of the vital American aircraft carriers deployed near the island of Okinawa was the USS Bunker Hill, and it was this ship that Ogawa was ordered to attack. On the morning of May 11th, the Japanese undertook a massive kamikaze attack on the US fleet, and among them was Ogawa. Following his leader, Lieutenant Seizo Yasunori, the two of them approached their target in the Mitsubishi Zero Fighters modified to carry a single 550 pound bomb. Amazingly, despite the heavy defensive forces arranged around the carrier, the two kamikaze pilots weren't spotted until it was too late. Making their attack at 10.004 hours, Lieutenant Yasunori released his bomb onto the deck before slamming his plane into the American ship. The bomb smashed through the wooden deck and into the sea, where it exploded, while Yasunori's plane destroyed up to 34 armed and fueled American planes. Just moments later, Ogawa made his attack. Releasing his bomb, it smashed through the deck. But unlike Yasunori's bomb, it exploded on the ship, killing numerous sailors and airmen. Once his bomb was released, Ogawa attempted to ram the island structure of the carrier, but fell short. Nevertheless, his bomb caused immense damage to the ship. In all, 352 crew members of the Bunker Hill were killed, and many more injured. The Bunker Hill was forced out of the war, and Ogawa's attack was a major success for the kamikazes. One can only imagine what goes through someone's mind as they undertake a suicide mission. In the final letter he wrote to his parents, Hiyoshi gives us some insights. He makes reference to a sortie, which is just a type of attack made from a defensive position. I will make a sortie, flying over those calm clouds in a peaceful emotion. I can think about neither life nor death. A man should die once, and no day is more honourable than today to dedicate myself for the eternal cause. I will go to the front smiling, on the day of the sortie too, and forever.